a little bit about me. I am a Texas native. Um, I grew up in Texas. I went to college at Baylor University in Texas. And I attribute my Texas roots to the fact that I am a foodie. I enjoy good, good food. And I am a sweet tea connoisseur. Um, I love a good glass of sweet tea. And I'm also a wife. I'm a Navy veteran. Um, the Navy is what brought me to San Diego, California, where I have lived for 10 years. And now for the last two years, I am bi-coastal between the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, in the community of San Diego, I have become well known for my community advocacy for the San Diego community. And tonight I am wearing the hat of attorney. So that is me. I practice business, nonprofit, and intellectual property law, which brings me to why I'm here tonight to talk about contracts. And I would like to learn a little bit more about you. Who do we have in the room? So if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a creative, if you are an influencer, please let us know in the chat who you are and what are your general um, what is the general reason why you're here tonight? Did you come to learn something specific? Do you have a question that you need answered? Or do you just want to learn more about contracts in general? Uh, maybe you've been in a contract dispute and you want to know how to avoid that the next time. So what made you not only register, but what made you show up tonight? Because I want to make sure that you get what you came here for. All right, so tonight I'm going to do a lot of talking but I hope that you all will communicate back with me as well. And so let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to start off with a little bit of a pop quiz. So this pop quiz is not gonna test your knowledge. It is going to test your perspective. So when I say the word contract, what do you think? You, do you think that a contract is a legal document that you send to someone to make sure that you don't get screwed over? Do you think it's a legal document that you put in place with big corporations, but not with friends or relatives? Or do you use and think of contracts as a regular legal document that is a part of your business transactions and your regular engagements with clients or customers? Let me know. Go ahead and place your A, B, or C in the chat, and you have 30 seconds to do so. All right, so the time is up and we're gonna talk about what is a contract. And this might change your perspective of the answer that you place in the chat on what a contract is. So when we talk about what is a contract, a contract is a meeting of the minds. Generally, what that means is it's an agreement. And so what the law requires for a contract to be valid is an offer, and acceptance and consideration. And so these are the three general principles. It, it can be a little more nuanced because there is things like age, being of legal age and being of mental sound mind that also goes into what makes a contract valid. But generally speaking, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on these three principles of the offer, acceptance and consideration. So what is an offer? An offer is, Camille offers to sell Jason his motorcycle for $5,000. That's an offer. An offer could also be the grocery store offers to sell you produce for the market price. An offer could also be AT&T offers to provide you cell phone service for a monthly rate. And then you have to decide whether you're going to accept that offer. You could be the one making the offer, but generally we're speaking in terms of understanding contracts. So you are the one that is trying to understand an offer that is being made to you and whether or not you should accept that offer. Now, once 
a party accepts an offer, then we have to look at the consideration factor. And that consideration is what we call in legal terms, a bargain for exchange. So we're looking at the value for value exchange. And that value does not have to equal money. Consideration can be in the form of money, but it also can be goods, it can be services, it can be a promise to do something. So if you have a bartering contract, uh, or so you could have a bartering contract, right? Such as my neighbor cuts my grass twice a month and I wash their car twice a month. So there's a value for value there. And so generally speaking, these three concepts of offer, acceptance and consideration is what any court will consider to determine whether a contract is valid. Now, when we talk about the contract being a meeting of the minds and in agreement, you have to understand that this is the reason why we have contracts, right? Um, the, there's a 14th Amendment um, in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment protects our rights to enter into private contracts without the government's interference. And that is what we, we consider an economic right. And this concept is known as the freedom to contract. So if we go back to the meeting of the minds, the freedom to contract says that a court is not, or the government is not going to consider whether the terms of the contract is fair because the assumption is that there was a meeting of the minds or an agreement on the terms. So if there's a dispute over the contract, the court or the government is going to assume that if you sign the contract, you agree to the terms. And at that point, the court is only looking to interpret and enforce the terms or the language of the contract, but not to determine whether or not the contract is valid or whether or not you actually agree to these terms. So that makes it very difficult for a court to hold a contract as unenforceable because people can enter into contracts freely with whatever terms they agree to, unless you can prove that there have been very specific legal violations. And so that means that there are very limited defenses available to you if you try to then request that a contract that you've signed not be enforced after you've signed it. So what do I mean when I say legal defenses? Legal defenses do not include things uh, like I was in a rush or they only gave me a day to read and sign the contract or else I would have lost the deal or the opportunity or the contract was too long or I didn't understand it. Those are not defenses. Legal defenses include things like they were threatening to harm me and my family members, which is what we call duress. Another legal defense could be, this person forged my signature, which is what we call fraud. Another type of legal defense could be, my grandmother was in a state of dementia when she signed this contract, which means she was legally incompetent, mentally incompetent to be able to legally sign the contract. Another type of defense could be, well, my son was a minor. He was not a legal adult when he entered into this agreement, right? So those are the legal defenses that we're talking about. Okay, so now that we've talked about what a contract is and why we have contracts, now let's get ready for another. <laughs> so this pop quiz asks, what are the four types of contracts? And again, we'll give you 30 seconds to put your answer A, B, C, or D in the chat.
Okay, so the correct answer is B. The four types of contracts that we have are unilateral, bilateral, implied, and express. So a unilateral contract is a contract from one party to another person or group of people who respond. So that, an example of that is, I will give a $500 reward to any person who finds my lost dog. That is a form of a unilateral contract. It is from one party to any person who generally responds to the open invitation. And then we have a bilateral contract, which is an exchange between two parties. And this is what we generally think of when we hear the word contract. We're generally defaulting to the thought of an exchange between two or more parties. But we also have implied contracts, which is a contract that is created through conduct, such as when you order food at a restaurant. You're not sitting down to actually sign a contract when you go to a restaurant, but there is an implied contract that you agree to pay the menu price for whatever food item that you order. And that's captured in your receipt. And sometimes you have to sign that receipt at the end. And then we also have express contracts. And express contracts can be either oral or written. So um, let's break this down just a little bit more. So with both unilateral and bilateral contracts, both of those can be either express or implied. For example, if you are conducting a business transaction at a yard sale, that is a bilateral contract. That's an exchange between two parties, but it's also an expressly oral contract, right? You're not sitting down writing out a contract to ask someone to pay $30 for an old chair, right? So that's an oral contract and it's a bilateral contract. And oral contracts are enforceable. And we know that we didn't always have written contracts. Back in the day, agreements were sealed with a handshake. But then we now have written contracts, which is the basis of this workshop. And we'll dig into that a little bit more. So in the 1600s, pre-United States, the English parliament passed the act for prevention of frauds. And we, as in the United States, in American contract law, we still rely on this act of prevention of frauds, which we call the statute of frauds. And the statute of frauds was passed to provide evidence of a contract in the case of a controversy and to prevent illegal engagements. And the statute of frauds required written contracts only for certain kinds of matters. And that included real estate transactions and engagements that could not be performed or completed within one year. And also purchases that were over $500. So this is how we move from oral contracts into written contracts based on this statute of frauds. And we know that today we generally rely on written contracts for business transactions because people lie. And, um, and with that, with written contracts, written contracts comes with its own set of pros and cons. So, you know, there's different kinds of answers for what people think of when they hear of a contract. You know, sometimes it's people think that they're signing their life away. Um, some people think that, you know, it's, it's only with big corporations. Um, some people think that, you know, they use it in every business transaction that they're engaged in. But we have problems with written agreements. One problem is that written agreements can be complex and hard to understand. And people outside of the legal industry generally don't have a clue of what they're reading with all of this legal language. Additionally, it's hard to know what's missing from a contract because what is omitted from a contract is just as equally important as what's written in the contract. We also know that sometimes contracts are just way too long. 
If you think about um, the click wrap contracts where it's a software contract, let's just say an Apple software contract that's long, um, it's like eight to 10 point font, it's, good, it's a gazillion pages, you gotta scroll, 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 single space, who's reading that? You know that one, you don't have any way to negotiate if you wanted to change something. You know that you need the software right now, otherwise I wouldn't be on here buying it. And you know that if I say no and I don't agree, then I can't use the software that I need to do whatever else I need to get done. So we know that a lot of times these contracts can be long, they're complex and hard to understand. Um, they can delay the transaction. For example, let's just say you are putting a bid in on a commercial property and it's a 30 page lease and you're like, oh my gosh, if I take this to someone, I need this done within a day, I need to understand it. If I take it to an attorney, they might take long. I just need to sign it so that I don't get outbid on this commercial space. And reading this contract and actually going through and trying to negotiate is just gonna delay the process. And I don't have time for that. So that is another issue that we find with written agreements. We know that sometimes there's no leverage to negotiate. Again, I go back to some of those software click wrap contracts. You have to scroll and click at the bottom. I agree to the terms and I accept the terms and conditions. There's no leverage to negotiate. You can't call Apple. You can't call PayPal and say, hey, guess what? I don't really agree with this provision in here. Is there any way that we can talk this through? There's no chance to negotiate. And then sometimes, when you really are in a pinch and you wanna hire a lawyer or you need a lawyer to help you understand, that costs money. So it costs money for good help, right? So these are all kinds of things that are wrong with written agreements. But what I want you to walk away from tonight is a general framework of what you should expect to see when you are reviewing contracts. And I definitely wanna answer any particular questions that you have around contracts in the language. Okay, we're doing very good on time. Okay, so let's get familiar with contract language. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is terms versus the term. So the terms plural, terms with an S, is generally referring to the language of the contract. But then there's also the term of the agreement of within a contract. And that term refers to the length or the duration of the contract. How long does this contract last? And this is important because this determines how long that you are going to be obligated to holding up your end of the bargain or your obligations under this contract. How long does this last? So generally speaking, you want to be looking for an effective date. When does the contract begin? And this could take the form of an expressly written specified date where it says, you know, in the, in the header, this contract is effective as of the date of June 21st, 2023. And it might even have effective date in parentheses right behind that, right? So it could be a specific date. It could default to the date that the last party signed the contract. So at the bottom, at the signature line, <laughs> excuse me, there could be a date, um, a date line, and the effective date is just the default of when the party signed the contract. Or the effective date could be a triggering event. Um, it could be something like if A happens, then B, and B starts the date of the contract. Okay, so you wanna pay attention to the effective date. When does the contract start? But you also wanna pay attention to the duration of the contract. How long does the contract last? Is it for one year, a fixed period of time? One year, 10 years, three years? Is it for a fixed period of time? Is there a renewal, an automatic renewal or an option to renew? So. This contract will last for one year with an option to renew if the parties agree. Or this contract lasts one year and renews every year automatically. 
And then there is, there could be an at will um, duration where it's like an employment contract where either party can cancel at any time. And then there could be a perpetual duration, which means this contract lasts forever. So the term of the contract is important because again, it sets the perimeter for how long you're bound to the obligations of this agreement. And it can be a red flag if you don't see a specific term outline, because usually the intent is that there is a perpetual, never ending agreement and that you're bound to those terms forever. That's not in every case, but I'm just talking about um, the general rule, not the exception. So when you don't see these types of things, either an effective date or a duration, that generally means that the contract is a perpetual contract and we don't want that because we evolve as people and relationships evolve and you want to be able to change those terms as the relationship between the parties evolves or if it no longer serves you. The next thing we need to look at is the purpose and the scope of work. So what are the duties and responsibilities of each party? What are you obligated to do under the contract? And what happens if you don't? Furthermore, what happens if you can't meet the obligations of whatever you are supposed to do in the contract? So for example, let's say that you're a painter and you're contracted to paint a commercial building and you break your hand. Are you allowed to delegate that task to someone else so that the work gets completed? Or does it have to be you? Let's say again, for example, that you're a painter and you're contracted to paint a commercial building and you got paid a 50% deposit to close off your calendar that for, for, for that person to secure the date, you close off your calendar so that you can complete the job. But the day before you start, the building burns down. No fault of your own, California forest fire, the building burns down. Do you have to return that deposit? Let's take another example. For this workshop, this workshop was advertised as being um, presented by a contracts attorney. So people are looking for a specific voice, a specific perspective. So if I happen to get in a car, car accident, God forbid, is there a penalty if I'm unable to then show up to the workshop tonight? In contract land, these are examples of things that we call impracticability, impossibility, or frustration of the purpose of the contract. And sometimes it can excuse the party who cannot perform their obligations for reasons outside of their control. But if that is omitted from the contract, then you don't get the benefit of it. So again, this goes back to me saying what's omitted from a contract is equally as important as what's written in the contract. Let's take one more example. We've all endured a pandemic and pre-pandemic, there is a contract clause called force majeure. And that states that if there's an act of God or some natural disaster, such as a hurricane or a tornado or an act of terrorism, that causes a party to be unable to perform their obligation under the contract, then all is forgiven. But I wonder how many times that clause was used pre-pandemic. I'm sure it's being used now, right? Because everything was closed down. There was shipping, labor, you know, um, shortages and shipping. So people's houses weren't getting built. Things just weren't happening. Who was at fault in those during, you know, based on those contract provisions? These are all important considerations that tie into the purpose and the scope of the contract. But another reason that you need to pay attention to the purpose and scope of the contract is because it's generally used to determine whether there is a breach of contract. So let's just say that you're a business consultant and you have a service offering that is your staple service 
um, that you provide six weeks of, cons uh, of, of consulting, business consulting. And you take on a client and that contract starts on June 1st, 2023. And it goes through July 15th, 2023. You and your client are scheduled to meet once a week. And your client cancels for one week because they have to attend a doctor's appointment. Do you have to extend the contract so that your client gets the benefit of six consultations? Or do they just get the benefit of the opportunity of six weeks, even if they only get five consultations within that six weeks? So you can see how the language of contracts can get really tricky really quickly. And let's just say you as a business consultant, you feel like you've made yourself available for all six weeks. You fulfilled your end of the contract, but your client is mad because they only got five consultations and they were expecting six. Are you in breach of your contract? Do you have a provision in the contract that addresses scenarios where clients have to miss a week for whatever reason? The point here is that the purpose and scope of a contract is important and needs to be very clear. So when you are reviewing contracts that you are signing, you need to make sure that you understand not only the obligations that you have under the contract, but also the obligations that the other party has to you under that contract. All right, so now let's talk about payments. So I think contract provisions that, that involve payments are generally pretty self-explanatory. Um, so we have things, you know, scenarios like hiring an independent contractor that you're paying $20 an hour, um, you could have a monthly payment such as a utilities or a cell phone service. Uh, you could have a salary where you're hiring an employee. You could have a flat fee or a lump sum such as a one-time hire, like a contractor to build a deck in your backyard or hiring a lawyer to draft a contract for you. Or you could have some type of commission based where you're hiring a salesperson or something to sell a product for you. There's all kinds of payment options. I think we've been exposed to many of those, but those payment options needs to be clear if the contract calls for some sort of exchange of compensation. So make sure you're paying attention to payment and when that payment schedule, how that payment schedule is drafted and worded in your contracts. Okay, so now let's talk about dispute resolution. What happens if the relationship goes awry? So these are terms that are often overlooked in a contract, but they're very important. So if a, if a party does not hold up their end of the bargain and there is in fact a breach of the contract, what do you do? How does that breach get resolved? Because it all depends on what's written in the contract. So, does the contract call for mediation, which is where we have a third party bring us together so we can woo-saw and reach an agreement between the, the parties? Does the contract call for an arbitration where we hash it out privately instead of going to court? Does the contract call for a small claims court issue, similar to what we see on TV where the parties represent themselves? Does the contract say nothing or does it have a court of law provision, which is the default typical court of law, state court, file a lawsuit, we go, we go to trial. Um, these are the things that you need to be thinking about or looking at and making sure that you understand when you're reviewing contracts. What, is, what are the dispute resolution terms? Another very important term that is often overlooked or just not really, people aren't really sure about is a governing law contract. And sometimes a governing law uh, provision is within the dispute resolution terms, but it can also be a separate paragraph in and of itself. But this is important because the governing law states which law will govern the contract. So if you live in California, 
and the governing law is Florida, then that means you're gonna have to travel to Florida to resolve the dispute because California is not going to try to interpret and enforce Florida law. Make sense? So these are things that you should be aware of at all times in with every contract that you sign. Look at that governing law provision and see what state's laws govern the contract that you're signing. Intellectual property rights can come up in various ways in contracts. It could be an employee agreement that states something like, if you work at Google, anything that you create, whether on duty or off duty, will be owned by Google. That's something that we don't want, right? So you have to look at, you know, what is the IP? Who owns it? What's the limits? Those types of things. If you're a graphic designer and you have a contract that states that, you know, anything that you design is going to be uh, owned by the client or owned by you or joint ownership, like what does that look like? Do you have uh, rights to your intellectual property? Do you give those rights away to the clients that hire you to create for them? Those are big considerations. You could be licensing your trademark or your copyright to another company and you need to determine how to limit the other party from using your trademark rights in certain ways. And there's all types of language about licensing and, and things that are it, hidden in contracts or not so hidden and people just don't understand what those words mean. So when it comes to IP, if you see words like perpetual or irrevocable, those are red flags. They should start flashing the alarms in your mind to say that maybe you wanna get a second opinion or maybe you wanna ask questions before you sign that contract. Because perpetual, again, means forever and ever and ever, which means that your children, your grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren will still be obligated to those perpetual terms of that contract. And if it's irrevocable, that means it cannot be taken back. So these are important words that should flash the flashing red lights if you see them within contracts. Perpetual, irrevocable ask questions or get a second opinion before you sign. Next, we will talk about liabilities and indemnification. So these sections are usually daunting sections in a contract. You see the big word indemnification, nobody really knows what it means. Um, and we see liabilities, which in general in contracts, somebody is limiting their liability. So let's say for example, um, you hire a contractor, you hire contractor number one to come and remodel your kitchen for $30,000. And the project was scheduled to be an eight week project. But 12 weeks later, you fire that contractor because they're not even halfway done and you're just wasting money at this point. You've been living in an Airbnb for those 12 weeks. And now you have to go hire contractor number two to come and fix what contractor number one messed up and did not complete. Contractor number two says, it's gonna cost $50,000, but I can have it done in five weeks. So now you're ready to sue contractor number one. Now, in this type of scenario, the law would typically allow for you to sue for the $20,000 difference between contractor number one and contractor number two, that $30,000, $50,000 difference, that $20,000 in between, that is what we would call compensatory damages in contract law. And the, the law typically allows you to sue for that, right? But the law could all, would also allow you to sue for what we would call incidental damages, which is those nine additional weeks that you've been living, living in an Airbnb, the money that's being spent on those nine weeks, 
the law would typically allow you to sue for, for a reimbursement of those expenses as well. So you have your compensatory damages, which is that $20,000 difference in the price. And then you have your incidental damages or special damages. That is nine weeks additional of Airbnb expenses because contractor number one breached the contract by not completing the job, okay? What a limited liability clause in a contract would do is limit the liability. So now you're only able to sue for one category of those damages, which is going to be compensatory because those cannot be limited by law. So instead of being able to sue for the $20,000 of compensatory damages, and let's say another $20,000 for nine weeks of hotel expenses, you're only going to be able to sue for that 20,000 in compensatory damages because of a limited liabilities clause. And so when you see these clauses, take a second look at what they're actually limiting. It's limiting the amount of money that you can recover if there is a breach, a fault or injury. It could be limiting recovery altogether. It could be limiting what kind of recovery that you can even receive. Maybe maybe it's not just that, maybe you can't receive money damages at all. Maybe you can only receive, um, may, maybe you buy a piece of furniture and it's broken and you want a refund. Maybe you don't get a refund. Maybe you just get a replacement or maybe you get a credit to use that um, to, to, for the value of, of what you receive broken, but you don't get a refund. So these are the types of limitations that limited liabilities are used for in contracts. So when you see that those liability provisions, read and look at what is being limited and how it affects you. Then we have the indemnification clauses. And indemnification clauses generally state that one party will pay the other party's court cost in the event of some triggering or compelling situation. So let's say, for example, you run a podcast and you have guests on your podcast and one of your guests starts to talk badly about a celebrity. Now that celebrity wants to sue you for defamation. You'd hope that you have an indemnification clause in your podcast agreement that says that if a guest comes on your show and says something that you get blamed for, they're paying the court costs for that. So generally that's what indemnity is doing. It is saying that if, if something happens with you, I'll take the blame and I'll pay the cost for it. But what often happens in contracts is that you as an individual are indemnifying the other party or a business and it's for no reason at all. So make sure that you look at the indemnification clauses as well and see who's indemnifying who. Is it a unilateral indemnification clause where one party is agreeing to indemnify the other? Is it a mutual clause where both parties agree to indemnify the other if something happens on each other's behalf at, at the each other's fault and, and, and is on behalf of each other's fault? What does that indemnity clause actually say? These are important considerations. Okay, one um, another provision that you should always, always, always be looking for in any contract that you sign is the modifications and amendments provisions. Can you make changes to the contract? And if so, how is that done? Generally, that should always be very simple in writing and signed by both parties. If there is not a clause, then that is generally being interpreted that there are no modifications or, amend or amendments that can be made. And we never wanna enter into contracts, or at least we try not to, to the extent that we can, avoid entering into contracts that cannot be changed or amended. Because again, relationships change, people change, and you need to be able to make changes when a relationship is no longer serving you. 
And that brings us to termination. How do we terminate our relationship with the other party? How can you end the contract? Can you end the contract early? Is there a penalty to do so? So if we think about a lease agreement, right? Generally, you're gonna, you sign a one-year lease agreement. If you wanted to end that contract early, there is a termination, if you're allowed to do so at all. And so these are things that we need to know in general in contracts. Do you need a specific reason or a cause to end a contract? If so, what kind of cause do you need? What is considered for cause to that other party? Is for cause because I can't pay? Is for cause because um, you know I'm in a domestic violence situation and I need to move? Is for cause, what is for cause? Because a lot of contracts will say, oh, you can terminate for cause, but then they don't say what for cause actually, what they consider for cause. So then it's up to their discretion to determine if your cause is a valid enough cause for them to agree to allow you to terminate the contract. So we need that enumerated and explained in, in the language of the contract. If there's no cause at all, then we need that explained as well. Do you have to provide notice? Sometimes you may need two weeks notice. You may need 30 days notice. Again, with the lease contract, sometimes you need 60 days notice. Even when there is a set ending termination date, you still need 60 days notice. Is there, um, is there a provision that talks about the contract terminating on its own after the term is over? What do we have to do once the contract has ended? Do either or both parties have to destroy information or return property? Is there a situation where a party is no longer able to use certain um, you know, intellectual property of the other. You have to cease using, you know, my trademark on your website or something like that. My logo on your website or my logo on your t-shirts. Um, are there any clauses that survive the termination of the agreement? For example, in some contracts, a confidentiality, um, provision may outlast the term of the contract where the term of the contract is for one year, but the confidentiality clause may last for three years. So it's also important to look at any survival clauses because that's gonna be important because you'll still be held liable to those survival provisions even after the contract is ended. So pending any questions, I will stop there. I will open up the floor and um, please, everyone, feel free to ask any questions. Let me stop the screen share. One hour later. Why use written agreements? So I hope that at least from what we've talked about tonight, you have some ideas on why written agreements, although they're flawed, why we should be using written agreements. So one, it minimizes misinterpretation, right? Um, on both sides, from, from the perspective of the offer, the offerer and the perspective of the person or entity who's accepting the offer. It also min minimizes the risk of conflict. So we know that if it minimizes misinterpretation, the more clear we are, the less trouble we'll have in carrying out our obligations under the contract. It also provides proof of an agreement. So if you ever do need to enforce your rights under the contract, you have proof of what you agreed to. It, written contracts are much easier to enforce than an oral contract. Again, if it's not in writing, it does not exist. Mm. And then it sets clear expectations. Again, we want to focus on being clear in what we are presenting. We want to be clear in what we are being held to. We want to be clear in what our expectations are. And so having it written down, we can always refer back to it. You asked me what I ate for breakfast yesterday. I don't remember. So if we can't remember what we generally did two days ago or what we ate for breakfast this morning, how can we rely on remembering what our obligations are under an oral contract. Mm -hmm. A written contract helps us to 
set those clear expectations and live up to those standards. And then here's some general contract mm -hmm. tips. As you engage in contracts in your everyday business transactions and in your everyday life. One, we wanna use written agreements. Two, we want to read those written agreements to the extent that we can. Now, I'm not talking about the click wrap contracts and the cell phone contracts. We know that that is just a part of life, some of those things that we have to live with. But when you are contracting, um, exchanging person to person and entity to entity in your own life and business transactions, read. Always, 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 to the extent that you can suggest changes. Because again, if you have to enforce this contract, the court or the government is going to assume that there was a meeting of the minds, that there was an agreement with the terms. So if there's something that you don't like, even if you don't know if the other party is going to agree to it, suggest the change. Suggest the change. And sometimes you have to be ready to walk away. Sometimes an agreement is so bad that you don't need to take the risk. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, a college student who needs a place to live and, and it's two days until school starts and they walk away because they don't like the fact that they can't have a pet, right? We're talking about contracts such as, hey, um, I'm going to provide you a service. You're going to pay me for that service, but you want to lowball. Or I'm going to provide you a service, and then you want to take all of my intellectual property. Or, you know, things that really matter and are going to matter long term. Sometimes you got to be ready to walk away. Last but not least, if you don't understand, you have to ask questions. That doesn't always mean that you have to run to a lawyer, but you should ask the question to the, to the people who you are engaging in the business with. So if you have an issue and you know you say, hey, uh, what, did you, what did you mean by this provision? What does that provision mean? Ask the questions. And then if it makes sense to you, then let it make sense. But if it don't, con but continue to ask questions. Um, and if you need to bring in reinforcements, consider talking to and consulting with an attorney. And then last but not least, I will just share some of my resources. Um, you can find me at talbertlawoffice.com. That is my website. You can follow me on social media. I have a YouTube channel. It's at Talbert Law Office YouTube channel um, where I talk about and I do videos on content like this all the time. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Talbert underscore law underscore office, or you can find me on LinkedIn at Talbert Law Office. I also have Marisa Talbert LinkedIn. So either one of those, you can find me, follow me on social media. I'd be happy to engage with you. And also, if you are looking for contracts, we have our TLO Marketplace, our Talbert Law Office Marketplace, which we house contracts, written contracts that I've drafted that you can use over and over again. They're DIY digital um, service-based contracts that you can pay and download and you can use them over and over and over again. And we don't leave you hanging. Not only do you get the contract, but you also get a user guide that show that talks to you and tells you how to use the contract and it explains every provision in that contract so you're not left wondering, what does this contract say? It gives you recommendations for different types of options that you can um, edit the contract to say for your own purposes and for your own business contracts, uh, business transactions. So you can find that at talbertlawoffice.com slash the TLO marketplace. So I hope that is helpful. Um, I'm happy to stay behind and answer any additional questions that anyone may have. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. I will turn it back over to you, Maureen. I'm a keep it pushy, yeah.